so we don't have to get ready. Amen. So real quick, we'll just jump into it. If we could all stand, turn your Bibles this, this uh, evening to Matthew chapter 24, and uh, we'll be in verse 36. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. And while you're making your way there, I just want to thank God for my salvation. I want to thank God for saving my life, for pulling me out of my mess, out of my bondage, out of the things that had me trapped and showing me that there was hope. And I thank God for a ministry like Victory Outreach that, uh, that was like, like Jesus, leaving the 99 for the 1. Amen. I felt like a lost cause. I felt like I was just going to continue in a cycle in my family, in a cycle in, in, in everything that I knew. But Jesus said, that's not the case. We're not the ones. Somebody say, we're not the ones. I'm thankful for that. And last but not least, I'm thankful for my wife. Hello, somebody. I was on, why are you guys all salty right now? Don't hate. Uh, don't hate because I waited. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Amen. She's, she's handling some stuff before we leave. We're leaving tomorrow, but uh, she's handling some stuff tonight. Amen. But I'm grateful for her. Amen. I know she's watching. But uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Are we there? It says, but about that day or hour, no one knows. Somebody say, no one knows. It ain't on your calendar. It's not on your notifications. Nobody knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Verse 37 says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Let's go ahead, let's bow our head, let's close our eyes, and let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you tonight for your word. God, I thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing within the gang, that you're doing within our lives. Father God, I, I just pray that you would just have your way tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we say amen and amen. If we could be seated here tonight. Amen. If you're taking notes, today I title the message, uh, As It Was. Kingdom come as it was. Come on, can somebody say, as it was. As it was, you know, if you don't know uh, what was happening right now in this portion of scripture is that something was about to take place. Jesus was doing ministry and he was getting ready to be crucified, to go ahead and die and to bring salvation and then to go ahead and resurrect on the third day and, and, and show the proof of who he was and everything that he came and he preached. But he was letting us know about his second coming about the time that he was going to come back to take his church, to take his people, and to establish his eternal kingdom. Because if you don't know that Jesus, just because we preach that Jesus came back before, we know that he's going to come back again. He's going to come back again, and yeah, people are going to say, I'll believe it when I see it. Everybody's going to see it. The Bible says that just like we see lightning in the east and it's spreading out to the west, that everybody's going to see it, that every, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that when Jesus comes back, it's going to be known. And the thing is this, is Jesus was letting his disciples know about what was going to take place. He was putting them on game. Somebody say putting them on game. They were asking him, they said, man, Jesus, how is it going to look so we know to get ready? How is it going to look so we know that, man, you're ready to come and to bring us back? Because at the time, they thought that he was going to come back in a couple days, and it was going to take out the Romans, and he was going to take out the people that had him in bondage. He thought they were going to take out the people that had him enslaved, but Jesus knew what he was doing. And he said that the times it's going to be like is going to be like the times of Noah. How many of you guys have heard of Noah. We hear about it when we're kids. They talk about Noah and the ark, how he had all the animals and how he took them there. But we can see that it's not just a kid's story. It's not just something that they have coloring pages or that it, that it has to, to, to sound good or to be a good bedtime story. But it was something that was real and it was something that's going to be like when Jesus comes back. Because we see that God gives us through Jesus in this scripture, that he gives us specific details for the pre-show, before the grand finale. 
You see, he goes to relate the times of his return to the times of Noah. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse 11 through 12, it says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all, all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. You see, the people in Noah's time, they didn't have God on their minds. They didn't have God in their hearts. They didn't have God on their, their to-do list. They didn't have God on their radar, but they had their own plan. They had their own ways. They had their own uh, 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 plans that they wanted to do. They put God out of the picture. They didn't put God in the picture. They knew that they had stories from generations before that they were created out of the dust and that God created the earth and that God had blessed and God had done all these powerful things. But along the ways, they didn't have their mind on God. They didn't have no respect for the Lord. They didn't have no type of love for God. They didn't have no type of urgency to get into the presence of God. They didn't even want to, to put God in his place. And I don't know about you, but if you go and you look on, on social media, if you go in your school, if you go in your workplace, you go in the street, you go on TV, you go on, on, on anywhere you look to, we can see that we are in a generation that is not mindful of God. In a generation that, man, they're fallen and it's far from God. We live in a generation that doesn't even want to think or put God first, but wants to put themselves first. But wants to put their plans first. It wants to put their pleasures first. It wants to put their desires first. And I can say that because I was there. I wanted what I wanted. Nobody was going to tell me anything. And if you told me, I probably got mad. And I was ready to like, mm. And I know because my tia would tell me all the time. I don't know who I was telling the other day, but it was three families of us living in a two-bedroom apartment. And at that time, I would go outside, I would go in the garage, or it was not even a garage. You don't see the apartments where they got the little, like, closet that's your garage. They had that in my, it was my grandparents and my tia and tios and all them. And we went out there, and, and, and uh, I went in there, and I was doing some little TP hut, chiefing a little bit like an Indian. And when I came out, my dear was like, Mijo, you need to stop. You need to let it go. You need to surrender. You're going to go to hell. I was like, man, dear, come on. You're blowing my high right now. Man, you're killing it right now. Get out of here. In my head, I was like, shut up. I didn't want to tell her that because she'll hit me fast. <laughs> but the thing was this, is that I, when, they, when God was right there playing in flat trying to tell me, I wasn't trying to hear it. And that's our generation. Our generation, they don't want to hear about God. They don't want to hear about God. Why? Because it puts us on blast. Have you ever been put on blast? It don't feel good. You start sweating. Your palms start getting sweaty. You're like, man, all eyes are on me right now. But a lot of times we don't want to hear about God because God puts us on center stage. Not to embarrass us, not to try and make us embarrassed or intimidated, but he does it to love us. Because he wants to show us, man, you're far from me, but I want you to come close. Yeah, you may be in sin. Yeah, you may be doing this. Yeah, you may be doing that. But all you got to do is come to me. All you got to do is lay down your burden. All you got to lay down your sin. All you got to do is lay down what you're dealing with. All you got to do is just surrender, and I'll take you in. But the generation was not mindful of God or even tried to pursue him. You see, then the people in Noah's time, they went about life, business as usual. They lived like they had time. And I want to let you know here today that, that, yeah, we're going about business as usual. Like, man, everything's good and everything's dandy, but we don't have time. We don't have time to waste. We don't have time to just go and say and put it off for tomorrow, but we got to do it today. You see, the greatest lie that we can fall into is believing that we have time. 
believing that, man, we'll, we'll, we'll have it for the next week or we'll have it for the next time, the next service, the next conference, the next time that they go to pray, the next time that they invite me to go and to read, the next time that I get a chance to read my word, I'll put it off for the next time. But that next time could be the last time. We never know when Jesus is coming back. He could catch us in the blink of an eye. And we, we, we got to be individuals that we're ready. The Bible says to be ready in season and out of season. Don't just wait that, man, when things are getting crazy to say, man, you know what, I'm going to start to get right. Don't wait till gas prices start going to seven. You're like, oh, Jesus, I need to get right right now. Do it right now. Don't wait till things go bad in your life to say, man, you know what, I need to turn to God now. He's going to hear you, but don't, why, why wait? Why wait till you go through a rough situation? Why wait till you go through tragedy in your life? Why wait till God has to humble you? Why wait till some situations get, get hectic in your life when you could turn to God right now? We have the time right now. We're God's anointed now generation, meaning that we're going to serve God right now. That, man, I'm not going to wait till I'm 30 years old and my life is past and I've all done this and done that to say I'm going to turn it over to God. And I'm not throwing shots at nobody that's older. I'm 25, and it's, I had to go through some things before I said, God, you know what? I'm done. Don't go through what we went through. I say it like I'm an old head, huh? <laughs> Don't go through what we went through. I went through some things as a youngster, but the thing is this, is I had to wait to go through those things before I surrendered to God. But we shouldn't have to wait. You could do it right now in middle school. You could do it right now in high school. You could do it right now with your family. You could do it right now with your kids. You could do it right now at your job. You could do it right now with your family. You could do it right now everywhere that you go. You see, the people of Noah's time, they were not mindful of God. But Noah was a different breed. Somebody say different breed. He was cut from a different cloth. He was a different type of person. He was a different type of individual that, that, that stood out from the rest. You see, it says in Genesis 6, 9, it says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. You see, Noah stood out from everybody else. In the midst of a fallen world, in the midst of a fallen generation, Noah stood out. Noah shined bright in the midst of darkness. Noah was able to be a beacon of, of, of hope. And it may have not been hope for them, but it was hope for us. To say, man, he was, God was said he was going to destroy the world, but he's going to give hope for something more. He was going to give hope to bring in the Messiah, to begin to bring in restoration, to begin to bring in salvation for each and every one of our lives. Noah was a different breed. Hebrews 11:7 says, by faith, somebody say faith. faith. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, somebody say holy fear, holy fear. built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Noah was different. Somebody say different. different. He was different. Everybody else probably looked the same. They may have had different features. They may have had different type of things on the outside, but on the inside, they were all the same. God says that they were corrupted. God says that they were sinful. God says that they were wicked in their ways. He's talking about their heart. He's talking about their mind. But Noah was different on the inside. His character was different. His lifestyle was different. The way that he lived amongst the people was different. And because of that, God was able to do something in that time. And today, our generation may be fallen, or today our generation may be dark, and the times may get hectic, and times may be crazy, but in the midst of darkness, we could be the light of the world. In the midst of a fallen generation, we could be an individual that we carry the cross, that we're able to walk, and we're able to plead the blood of Jesus, that we're able to be individuals that we walk in victory when everybody else living in this living defeated, when everybody is living bound, we're able to be individuals that we live free. 
free, when everybody feels like they're down and out, we're able to bring them the message of hope and to see them brought out of darkness, to see dead things brought to be living things. We're able to see the supernatural and the midst of natural. Man, our generation needs hope. Our generation needs a peace. It needs a breakthrough. It needs rest in their lives. Why? Because they're dying. Why? Because time is running now. Because, man, God wants to show people love. He wants to love the outcast. He wants to love the hurting individual. He wants to mend the broken hearts. He wants to begin to mend the broken families. He wants to begin to break generational curses. He wants to begin to break shackles and mindsets and things that have them hurt. But we can't see it if we're living the same. We can't see it if we're walking and talking just like them. Pastor shared a devotion today. He said that, that the Pharisees, that they were able to pray, they were able to fast, they were able to read, but their hearts weren't right, so there was nothing behind it. They had no power. Noah was able to have the favor. Why? Because he lived different. Noah was able to see the hand of God move in his family and even into his children and their families. Why? Because he lived different. He lived different amongst the people. We need to come out from amongst the crowd. We can't hold back. We can't be shy. We can't be, be hesitant with God. But we got to take full advantage of while it is day. While we still got the time right now to take advantage to say, God, I'm going to give my heart to you. God, I'm going to surrender to you. Those things that I have in my heart, I'm not going to try and battle with it no more. I'm not going to try and flirt with it no more. I'm not going to try and hold it and deal with it on my own. But I'm going to surrender it to you. I'm going to live holy. I'm going to live righteous. I'm going to live sold out for you. You see, Noah was sold out. He wasn't a sellout. We, we got to be sold out for God, not sellouts. We can't be Esau. How many of you know Esau? Hope you do, because Pastor preached on it the other day. Esau sold out his birthright for a bowl of soup. We got a purpose. You got a purpose. Do you know that? You got a calling upon your life. You got something that God wants to do within your life. You got the goods because God sent his son to die on the cross for you. And he wants to begin a part over your life. But we got to sell out to God. We got to be sold out to the Lord. We got to begin to say, God, this is what my life is going to be now. This is what I'm going to live. This is how I'm going to build my house. This is how I'm going to build every choice that I make. But if we're sold out, then, man, God ain't going to be... Who he needs to be in our lives. The frajo is going to be better. The side piece is going to be better. The extra money is going to be better. Oh, I'm hitting it right now, huh? If we're, if we're, if we're not sold out to God, then we're going to be selling out to everything. Whatever comes your way, whatever feels good. Take my money. You guys ever seen the, uh, I seen a picture the other day. I don't know what cartoon it was from, Futurama. But it was like, I don't know, it was some weird video. I don't know what it was. I'm like, man, who would want to buy that? And then it goes to the next thing. The dude's like, take my money. Gives him the credit card. Gives him everything. Gives him the social security. That's how it is when sin comes in our lives sometimes. We'll say, ooh, yummy. Ooh, it feels good. Ooh, I like. Take my money, take my life, take my years, take my, take my youth, take my, take my time that I got, take all that I have. But we need to be sold out to the Lord. You see, Noah shows us how to live in a generation that is fallen and far from God. And he didn't just live as someone who was surviving, but somebody who was thriving in his relationship with the Lord. And right now, just because everything looks crazy and we got all these different things that want to sell to us, we, can, we could be individuals that we don't survive day to day. We could be individuals that we're not just trying to make it in our relationship with God. Like, oh, I'm just trying to stay saved. I'm just trying to stay alive. I'm just trying to stay holding on. But we could be individuals that we're walking in power. There were individuals that were walking in victory. We could be individuals that are walking with confidence and assurance to say, you know what, man, I'm called. 
we wake up, man, we're able to shine and we're able to be all happy and excited. Why? Because we know we got a calling on our lives. Why? Because we know that, man, God is with us. And if God is with us, then who could be against us? The greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That we're able to know that, man, God is on my side. But we can't do that if we're not getting in our word. You can't say or know or be excited about what you don't know about. You ever be in a conversation when they're talking about something you don't know about? You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I feel when they talk about football. All I know is Seahawks, Raiders, Rams. That's all I know. 49ers. 49ers, too. But they say the stats. They say the whole thing. I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, 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 man. I'll rock the jersey. Jordan. Jordan's the draft king over here. I'm draft king. But they talk about everything. I'm like, oh, yeah, cool, cool, cool. I'm just there, but I don't even know what's going on. I'm like, yeah, touchdown. I throw in words that, that, that make sense. That's how it could be with our relationship with God. We're like, oh, yeah, pray. Oh, yeah, read. Oh, yeah, fast. Oh, yeah, come to church. Oh, yeah, this. Oh, yeah, that. But we don't really know. If we were to ask afterwards, we'd be like, hey, you'd be like, um, let me phone a friend. Let me call somebody. But the thing is this, is we got to be individuals that we know. The Bible says to study and show ourselves approved. Because if you do those things, then you'll be able to be equipped for the task. You'll be able to be filled. He says that when we have the word in us and we'll be springing up uh, wells of living water, when you have those things in your life, it has no other option but to come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the what? Man, what? Speaks. What's inside has to come out. A bad tree can't bear good fruit and a good tree can't bear bad fruit. Hello, somebody. What's done in the dark will be brought to the light. We need to know that, man, what God wants to do is we got to be individuals that we're going and getting into the Lord. Why? Because, man, it's, it's, it's the time where, man, it's getting serious. They ain't playing no games. It's on site. It's on site because, man, the thing is this, that we got to be individuals that we're thriving. And I know this, and, man, God wants to, he said, and I know it's true because he said it through the prophet Joel, and he said it through Peter. He said that, man, what is happening in the upper room is a prophecy that he said in the last days, he's going to pour out his spirit on young men, that they're going to have dreams, that they're going to have visions, that they're going to be used for God's honor and God's glory. But he, he said that in those last days that we're going to be able to be individuals of power, individuals of the supernatural. Do you know that you got the goods in your life? From the moment you were in your mom, mama's womb, he already deposited it in your life. He already put it in your life. You were going to be a pastor. You were going to be a missionary. You were going to be an evangelist. You were going to be somebody to do something great for God. But you got to dig in deep so that that could begin to burst out of your life so that you could thrive in what God called you to do. So that God could begin to develop you and use you right now in our generation. Because our generation needs somebody like you. Because everybody says, where's God at? What's God going to do? What's God going to do right now? Doesn't he see all the chaos? Doesn't he see all the hurt? Doesn't he see all the pain? And he says, hello. I sent my son. And he gave you instructions. He said to go, to pray, to wait, and when the Spirit comes on you, it will give you power to be witnesses. He'll give you power to be into all of the world. So what does that mean? If we're saying, man, what's God going to do? He's going to use you. That's how he's going to do it right now. But if we don't do it, then we're just going to be watching the world burn. You see, Noah's life was a life that was driven. And his life was driven by two things. Two things. The first thing is this. Noah's life was driven by faith. Can somebody say faith? faith. Genesis chapter 6 verse 9. And I read this a little bit ago. It says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. He, and he walked faithfully with God. See, I said it, that he was somebody that was different, right? He was an individual that his characteristics, his resume, his whole stats about his life, they were different from everybody else. It says that Noah was considered righteous. He was considered blameless and faithful before God. You see, and these became a part of who he was. 
Why? Because of the element of faith in his life. The faith that he had, that had a hold of him. What he believed, what he held dear in his heart is what began to bring out these things in his life. Because you see, faith is our key. Faith, faith is a key and faith is our seed. We, we, we can't expect to see breakthroughs or to see the fruits of the Spirit if we don't first have faith in God. The Bible says that, that in Hebrews 11, 6, that, and without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who, comes to, anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You see, we must have faith. We hear it all the time, so probably sometimes our ears get numb to it. Faith, faith, faith. We got to have faith. What? Have faith in God. Do you believe that God is who he is in your life? Believing that God is Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Believing that God is Jehovah Nisi, our banner of victory. Believing that he is Jehovah Shalom, the God of our peace. That he is who he is in our lives. A lot of times what happens is, just like I said, we could say something that, we, 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 that sounds good, but we don't know nothing about it. We got to know who God is. We got to have faith in God to say God is my king, God is my, my protector, that God is my healer, that God is the one that's able to move in the miraculous in my life. We got to have faith. Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that God is on your side? Do you believe that God is wanting to move in your life even if it looks all bad? Have you ever been in a situation when it seems like, man, does God really love me? Does it, man, does God really on my side? Because it don't feel like it right now. It don't look like it right now. Man, you guys are act, playing games right now. I'll be the first one to tell you I felt like that. When I'm like, man, okay, God, I'm like, okay, should I keep going or should I keep going in? Because every time I do, it gets down bad. It gets ugly. But you know what's crazy is that, man, those things are not meant to break you, but they're meant to build you. It's meant to build your faith. It's meant to strengthen your faith. It's meant to develop your faith. It's meant to give you stepping stones, not stumbling blocks. A lot of times what happens is we lose faith in those times. A lot of times we lose hope in those times. A lot of times we, we, we choose to say, man, God, whatever. You didn't come through on my clock. You didn't come through on my time, so... Peace, I'm out of here. I'm going to go and do my own thing. I got it. We got to have faith in God. Yeah. Know that, man, when things are crazy, when things are ugly in your life, that God is still there. Yeah. You're not alone. You're not forsaken. Why? Because he told Joshua, and he's still the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore, that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah. That he is who he is. Yeah. That he won't leave you. He'll never forsake you, but he is who he is in his life. Yeah. We got to have faith in God. We got to have faith in his word. We got to have faith in his word. Why? Because this is how we learn. If you don't believe it, then you're going to be like, yeah, whatever. Probably just get it tatted somewhere. Probably just get it on your bio somewhere. Have it look good on a t-shirt. But I told this, don't let it be written just on your notebook, but let it be written on your heart. Because the Bible says that in your heart, I have hid, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Amen. We need to let the word of God be written on our hearts. Amen. Why? Because it's the lamp to our feet. His word is a lamp to our feet. You want to know how to live different in our generation? Begin to learn and have faith in the word. Begin to learn who God is through the reading of his word. Begin to learn promises. Begin to learn things that have happened through history. Begin to learn the men and women that have gone through things that you've gone through. The Bible says that nothing is new under the sun. Nothing is new. There's people that have gone through what you've been through. We're able to learn by having faith in his word. We must have faith. Mark chapter 11, verse 22 through 23, it says, have faith in God. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. We got to have faith. We can move mountains with our faith. We can move mountains. I'm not telling you to go to Badger Mountain and 
I think I can. I think I can. Get up and go. Out of here. Afuera. No, that's not what he's talking about, but the mountains in your life. The mountains in your mind, the mountains in your family, the mountains in your household, the mountains in your workplace, the mountains in your school. But you got to believe it. He says if we believe and we don't doubt, then, man, there will be some breakthroughs that happen. And the thing that, that, I, was, that I was thinking about and, and, and it got me was, uh, you ever see, what's that movie, Doctor Strange, the new one? The Maya, Madness or whatever, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. There's a scene, right, where they're, they're in their, their temple or their place, and that, that witch girl or whatever, she's up there on top, and she's getting ready to straight mollywop every one of them. But they go and they put their shield up, and so she's, like, trying to go through it. She's like, man, I can't get in. I can't get in. I can't do it. And then she, like, there looking, and she's going and going, hovering over every person, trying to get in some way. And they're like, oh, he's trying to get in your mind. Guard your mind. He says, guard your mind. But there was some youngster. He was, like, shaking in his boots. And he didn't, he didn't have his mind covered. So what happened was this. She got in him, and she said to run. And the moment that it got in him, it said to run, run through, and she broke in. That's what could happen when we doubt the promise of God in our lives. We give a foothold. The Bible says to not give the enemy a foothold. Our doubt can be a foothold. They begin to make the whole Jenga house crumble. Can make it all fall. And if you doubt, I'm not trying to tell you it's over with. I'm trying to just ch- trying to help you out here. Is that you can have faith to overcome those doubts. It says in, in 2 Corinthians 10, 9, 10, 5 that we take hold of every thought. We bring it captive to Christ. We bring it to the authority of Jesus, beating it into submission. That's how we got to be. We got to have faith and we got to grab a hold of those things and start just kicking that thing, giving it a stop it out. But we got to use the word. By having faith in the word, we're able to combat the sword of the spirit. That's our offense. That's how we're able to fight back. <laughs> you see, we can, we can move mountains, but we, we, can, we can't doubt. It says that a double-minded person is tossed to and fro like waves in the wind. You can't expect to be solid if, if we doubt. Salute. We can't expect those things if we're not able to stand and but the day-to-day things helped us to be built up. Consistency, being, being steadfast day in and day out. You build it, you build it, you build it. So don't give up. Don't give up. Don't expect that you're going to walk out this door and your faith is going to be on swole. Don't, don't expect that. I'll tell you that right now. Don't expect that. I mean, if it does, amen, praise God. I'm going to pray for it, actually. We'll pray it. But it's a, it's a thing that is gro- that's grown. It's a thing that's grown. You ever, you ever had uh, uh, plants? When we took over the leadership hub and we were there, there was a, a flower bed. And I went out there the, the first, I think it was the first week or whatever. And I was like, man, these plants are, they're dead, man. They don't want to grow. They don't want to do everything. But the weeds, there were a lot of them just growing left and right, man. And I was like, man, what in the world? And I didn't, and God told me this. He says that, man, that, the, the, the negative things in your life, they're going to come easy. The simple things, they're going to come easy in your life. Doubts are going to come up easy. Uh, a, a lack of faith is going to come up easy. Temptation is going to come up easy. But the good things, they got to take some work. They're going to take some sweat. I was out there sweating. I was like, man, bro, come on. I'm going to just rip this out at the root right now. Get rid of it right now. But I'll tell you this, that it got some, it's budding a little bit. It ain't the best. I'm not, I'm not a, uh, what is it, Flores? I ain't no Flores, but uh, green thumb. I don't got no green. I don't got no green thumb. But when you, when you work it, it works. It grows. What you feed grows. What you feed grows. You see, he was able to have strong faith in God because he did not just know about him from other people's experience, but he knew him for himself. So we're able to do it when we work it, when we grow it, when we develop it, when we grow in those things, right? <coughs> so we got to know God, right? And the thing is this, I wrote this, is that have you ever sort of knew somebody but never really knew them? They were just around. They were just in the circle. They were just in the midst, and they were just somebody, oh, yeah, what's his name? Or, yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, you don't know them from Adam. 
And the thing is this, is we don't want to be those type of ind individuals that we're just around God, but we never knew him. Yeah. We're just in the circle. Or we're just in the midst, but we never know God for ourselves. When you know God, you have faith in God, you have faith in his word, and you begin to grow strong. How many of you guys want to be strong? Yeah. I want to be strong in my faith. I want to make sure that when, when the things get crazy and when the, tortilla, when the beans hit the tortilla, man, I'm ready to go. I'm, re I'm ready. Why? Because the things that were done in the dark are ready in the light. Yeah. And the second thing is this. Noah's life was first driven by faith, and then his life was driven by fear. Come on, can somebody say fear? fear. Some of you are probably, man, I ain't scared of nobody. <laughs> Superman syndrome. But Noah was an individual that was driven by fear. And I'm not just talking, I'm not talking about fear like, Oh, my God. Well, yeah, he had that type in his heart, but he had a holy fear. He had a holy fear. Why? Because it says in Genesis 6.22, it says, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Genesis 7, verse 5, it says, and Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. You see, Noah acted through holy fear. He had faith in God's word and had the fear that God acts on his word. You see, because if you don't know what Noah was going through, what was happening, God gave him a fat old list. He said, go get these cypress, go get all this, go do that. He gave him measurements. He did all this and that. And he says, and you got to do it because I'm going to flood the earth. So what happened was is the fear made him get into action. Because we can know the word, we can know this, know that. But if there's no action, faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. So because he had the fear, it got him moving. I'm pretty, I don't know how long afterwards he took it. I don't even know how he took measurements, how he cut. But he made that thing happen. Probably use a shoelace, sitting there signing with the shoelace. I don't know. They probably didn't have shoelaces back then, but he made it happen. The fear made him make it happen in his life. He knew that, man, if God said it, God's going to do it. I better not slack. I better not put it off because I don't want to get caught lacking. And the thing is this, is that fear will do something to us. Fear will get you moving. Fear will get you out of your seat and get you like, man, I'm going to, I better not waste no time. I better not push it off, and I better get busy. You see, Proverbs 1, verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. We got to fear God. Nobody moves or nobody seeks God. Why? Because they don't fear him. They don't fear who he is and that he's going to come back and do what he says. If anything, they get mad and say, man, how can God want to come and want to send somebody to hell or condemn somebody or this and that? But God is a God of love, but he's also a God of judgment. He's a God of wrath. He's a God that when he comes back, it's going to be the great white throne of judgment. That he's not just saying and whispering sweet nothings in our ear, but hey, he's going to be about his business. And so Noah knew this, that man, God is God don't play. So he said, you know what, if he said he's going to do it, then, man, I better start building. I better start making things happen. I better start putting this boat together because it's coming soon. I don't know when, but I want to be ready. And we got to learn that we got to fear God. And I'm not talking about fearing God, that, man, God's going to God's gonna uh, uh, be some type of individual that just punishes you day in, day out, like, oh, oh flinching, like you're going to get beat, but in a sense of respect. In a sense of reverence, in a sense of putting some respect on God's name. You guys ever see that video of, of Birdman? He said, put some respect on my name. That was Birdman, right? Or no? I don't know. You guys are all acting like, I don't watch those. <laughs> there was one of them. I don't know who it was. I thought it was Birdman. Some dude with tats over his face. But he said, put some respect on my name because they were talking about him. And he confronted him and, and right there in the the radio station, yeah, and he's like, put some respect on it. We need to put some respect on God's name. When we respect something, we hold it at value. We hold it at an honor. If I could get the worship team, we put respect on it. We, tr we, we, we don't want to, we don't want to mess with it. We want to make sure that, man, man, I don't want to cross those lines. I don't want to cross those boundaries. Why? Because we know that, man, there's repercussion. You won't just go outside and say, man, I need some money, so I'm going to go and rob Circle K. <laughs> you don't go out there and say, man, I got to make something happen. Hey, I like that car. I'm going to go and take it. No, we don't do that. Why? Because we say, man, the police. <laughs> we say, oh, I, 
forget the police, but hey, to a certain point, you're like, I'm going to respect it because that badge will do something. But the thing is this, is when we fear God, is we're putting God at the place that he deserves within our lives. We let him sit on the throne of our hearts. It says that what the <coughs> where your treasure is, there your heart is also. What do we treasure? What do we put at a place of priority in our hearts? What do we place at a sense of all, all priority, of all, all of our attention, of all of our respect, of all of our love, of all of our dedication, of all of our commitment, of all of our drive? Where does it go? If it's not to God, then maybe that's not why we're not.